Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name's Michelle Lim. I'm based at the Yong Pong Hao School of Law in Singapore, Singapore Management University. And I'm also a deputy chair of the Biodiversity Law Specialist Group of the World Commission on Environmental Law. Given the topic we're about to engage with today concerning biodiversity law issues as they relate to and how they go beyond to the global biodiversity framework currently being negotiated in Montreal. I think it's especially important to acknowledge that many of us are speaking from and listening on unceded sovereign indigenous lands. And I pay my respects to indigenous elders past and present for sustaining land, waters and country since the beginning of time. This webinar, comes to you as part of a series from the World Commission on Environmental Law. And it's being jointly organized by the Biodiversity Law Specialist Group and the WCL's Plastics Task Force. We are also especially indebted to our chair, Christina Voigt, Professor Christina Voigt, who is here with us today, but also Deputy Chair, Ayman Shekhauri, and also special thanks to Roberto Cole, who has made all of this possible. We're also particularly grateful that Christina has offered to share with us how this series links to the range of other webinar series and the work of the WCL, but also the important negotiations currently occurring under the Convention on Biological Diversity in Montreal. Christina, please. Thank you so much, Michelle, and uh, a very warm welcome to everyone who is joining us here today and also to everyone who may be watching the recording of this webinar, which we will put online on the WCL website for everyone to revisit or listen to in their own time. Um, I would just like to mention briefly, as Michelle said, that this webinar is part of a webinar series which we established at the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law. The overarching topic of the webinar series is the uh, transformative power of law in addressing global environmental challenges. And we aim at discussing contemporary issues in international and national environmental law in the form of these uh, webinars where we invite uh, our colleagues within the commission and outside the commission to share with us their insights and their reflections on, uh, as I said, contemporary issues, on current meetings, on outcomes of negotiations, on court cases and other initiatives. And we all hope that you will join us in many of the webinars uh, to come. Um, I just mentioned that we yesterday uh, organized one webinar on the outcomes of the negotiation, uh, first round renegotiation round on the plastics agreement, and we will continue in this uh, matter. Now, today uh, we will focus on uh, how the global biodiversity framework can make progress towards a world living in harmony with nature. And I would like to express my sincere gratitude to both the chair, Professor Emmanuel Kazimbasi, and the deputy chair, Professor Michelle Lim, of the Biodiversity Law Specialist Group of the IOCN World Commission on Environmental Law, which is one of our new specialist groups, so only established earlier this year. And we are very grateful and indebted to both Emmanuel and Michelle for their excellent work on this issue. And my thanks goes also to Professor Alexander Harrington, who is the chair of the IOCN WCL Task Force on the Agreement to Address Plastic Pollution. Now, today's topic, which I already mentioned and which Michelle mentioned, uh, how the global biodiversity framework can make progress to a world living in harmony with nature is closely linked to the ongoing negotiations uh, currently on, uh, uh, happening in Montreal under COP15 of the CBD. Living in harmony with nature, as we all know, is the, um, hopefully will be, the vision uh, the overall vision of the global biodiversity framework once it is adopted, hopefully, by the end of this week. 
Now, some of you may know that the IUCN in general and the World Commission on Environmental Law had a significant stake in the elaboration and the early beginnings of the negotiations of the Convention on Biological Diversity in the early 90s. The WCL was one of the legal masterminds behind the Convention, and we have followed the negotiations and the biannual conferences of the parties, the COPs, pretty much every Ever since. But this particular COP ongoing currently in Montreal um, is a very, very important one for several reasons. One reason is that the science is incredibly clear as assessed by the IPBS on the very dire state of global biodiversity ecosystems and species. We all know that transformations, global transformations are necessary in order to address species and biodiversity and ecosystem loss. Um, and in that context, of course, law is a crucial driver and lever to bring about these transformative changes. But we also know that the Convention on Biological Diversity is working through its 10 year strategic plans. We had a 10-year strategic plan from 2000 to 2010, and then a new one from 2010 to 2020, which contained the Aichi targets. And those targets, most of them were not met. So it's incredibly important to set new, but also achievable targets at this COP now in Montreal. And it's gonna be important to get the targets right, it's an urgent task. We have not much time uh, to lose. We actually have no time to lose. And the targets need to be clear. They need to be aggregatable. They need to be quantitative when they are possible to quantify, ambitious, fair, and measurable. But the targets alone is not everything that needs to fall in place. They also has to be a system around these targets included in the global biodiversity that ensures that these targets are effectively implemented. And that links to the absolutely crucial role of law in the context at what this global biodiversity framework is to achieve. Targets need to be linked to the core obligations that parties have under the Convention on Biological Diversity. For example, parties have the obligation to communicate National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plans, NBSAPs, and these new targets need to be linked to those NBSAPs because that's where the legal obligation lies. Second, there will have to be a, a robust monitoring, reporting and review framework in order to keep track on how well parties are doing in implementing those targets all the way until the end of this crucial decade. And thirdly, as I already indicated, there have to be in place nationally uh, national implementation measures, effective implementation measures, true national regulation, legislation, which also needs to be complied with, implemented and enforced on the domestic level. So it's not all about international law that can only be the framework around uh, national action and implementation. And in all this, lawyers have a crucial, an absolutely crucial role to play in addressing the global triple crisis of biodiversity loss, climate change, and global uh, pollution. And my sincere hope is that this seminar today will contribute to enlighten what lawyers can do and then strengthen the role and the rule of law in addressing this global challenge. And with that, back to you, Michelle. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Christina. That was exactly what we needed in terms of articulating why it is so important to address biodiversity, but also importantly, how law can be part of that transformative change. And an excellent segue to what I'm about to talk about now, which is managing expectations for all of you listening at home. Now, we are today, we won't be talking about brackets. Those of you that are in Montreal, ICE and Alexandra are in Montreal, will know what I'm talking about in the negotiations of the Global Biodiversity Framework. And there is still uncertainty and disagreement around the text of what the 
hopefully 22 targets will look like. And a lot of the negotiation is around that bracketed text. We won't be going, sorry to disappoint those of you who were hoping that this was an overview of, of brackets. We won't be talking about the brackets, but we will be linking to key themes that arise across the current 22 draft targets. And importantly, linking to what Christina was just saying, the role of going beyond the global biodiversity framework, linking to it, but also looking at the key instruments in law that would enable, hopefully, the global biodiversity framework, which hopefully will come out um, on Monday to be implemented. So I'm excited to introduce to you our wonderful panel of speakers, and I'll then, having introduced you to this excellent team of experts that we have here today, I will then explain the nuts and bolts of how it's going to work in our discussion today. So first of all, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Emmanuel Kazimbazi, who is chair of the WCL Biodiversity Law Specialist Group, my partner in crime, in, in the specialist group, not wildlife crime, I assure you. And Professor Kazimbazi is a professor of environmental law and policy, director of the Environmental Law Center. He has taught for many years and including acting as Dean and head of department of the School of Law at Makerere University in Uganda. And for those of you in, Can in Canada, Emmanuel also has spent quite a lot of time and studies in Canada. And so he has a special empathy for those of you dealing with the particularly cold winters and um, freezing temperatures in Canada. Welcome, Emmanuel. I'd next like to introduce and welcome Professor Alexandra Harrington that as um, Christina foreshadowed the inaugural chair of the IUCN WCL Pollution Task Force. And I, I don't always want to believe what I read on the internet. And this was one of those um, situations. But I think she's got three books. She's written three books on global governance, international organizations, and the last one on just transitions. And at the current rate, it's like a book a year. Uh, and on top of that, um, leading the, the Plastics Task Force being based at Lancaster University. And we also have with us today Professor Kelsey Leonard, who is a water scientist and protector, but also a legal scholar, policy expert, writer, and enrolled citizen of the Shinnecock Nation. And Kelsey represents the Shinnecock Nation on the Mid-Atlantic Committee on the Ocean. She's also Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Waters, Climate and Sustainability at the University of Waterloo. Welcome, Kelsey. I'd also like to welcome um, Aishigul Shirkaya at Lund University and is an expert and legal advisor on the Nagoya Protocol on issues of access and benefit sharing. We'll also have with you later today, Pro Professor Claudia Etwate-Lima, who's a senior researcher at the Raoul Wallenberg Institute in Sweden and an international public lawyer. And importantly for our current context, studies the linkages between human rights, biodiversity and climate change, but importantly, the fora and other instruments that can facilitate existing global conventions, such as the Convention on Biological Diversity, to be Im implemented um, at the regional level. So welcome, Claudia. So how are we going to do this today? It's not going to be a series of PowerPoint presentations. Our experts have prepared answers and responses to three questions. And these questions span the very broad areas of biodiversity law, because as Christina foreshadowed, biodiversity touches every area of our lives. It's linked to the natural world, but also everything we do relies from fresh, fresh air, clean water, food security, relies on biodiversity. 
So each of our speakers will talk for three minutes on a critical issue of biodiversity law and explain why it is important. We'll start our first question in reverse alphabetical order. And um, in, for our second question, it will, will, our second question will deal with, well, what are some of the challenges for addressing the particular issue that our experts have identified? And for that question, we'll go in reverse um, uh, in, we'll, we'll then go in alphabetical order by first name. And for the final question, importantly about ways forward, then it's pretty much a free fall. Whoever would like to answer first, uh, please do raise your virtual hand, but I will also call on people if people are, are, are a bit hesitant. If you're listening at home, you might be wondering, well, where do I feature in all of this? We've thought about you as well. So as I said, we'll be linking to components of the global biodiversity framework. I don't want to preempt what each of our experts are going to say, but I will give a hint as to what I think they're going, they are going to be talking about. So feel free to enter into the chat box what topic of biodiversity law you think our expert will be talking about, or if you're the type that likes yelling at computer screens um, for game shows, feel free to do that as well. You're on mute, we can't hear you. And at the end of this, we'll invite questions also again in the chat box. Our experts are ready to go. I think you are ready to go at home as well. So let's start with this. First question, what's the critical biodiversity issue? Why is it important? And for this first question, Kelsey. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I think I've, uh, there we go, have my video going. Um, I, I think one thing that's really important for us to, to center around is when we think about biodiversity laws are the communities and the voices who have been historically and contemporarily excluded um, and continue to be marginalized and excluded from these types of laws. And so, you know, one of the sort of core and keen statistics that we have um, about our maintenance of biodiversity on this planet today is that although indigenous peoples, um, due to colonialism and genocide and the illegal takings of our lands, only uh, control about 22% of the land um, and, and waters on this planet, we, within that 22%, maintain 80% of the world's biodiversity. And so we're obviously doing something right. Um, and, and that, I think, is where the rest of the world is starting to also um, have a reckoning of, of that care and stewardship and of that knowledge and scientific practice for conservation and for biodiversity maintenance that we have within our legal systems, but also within our general care and stewardship practices to the natural world. And so what is really disheartening when we think about the state of global biodiversity laws is that there are very, very few, less than 1% that actually are constructed in such a manner that Indigenous peoples um, have a seat at the table, are decision makers, are seen as rights holders. Um, even when we look at the global, um, the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, Indigenous peoples are not included. And I think it's actually um, a representation of, um, of a failed international law. Um, it It's speaks to us in certain ways that um, there is a, a misalignment or a need for realignment of the CBD because it's currently in violation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, by not allowing for Indigenous peoples and Indigenous rights to be protected um, in how it's implemented and in how these targets are set and in how these uh, these COP conferences occur. Um, and so I think there are massive implications around injustice when we look at the current state 
state of global biodiversity laws. And when we look at the push for 30 by 30, um, it's often being done in such a manner that disproportionately burdens indigenous lands and territories um, to be quote unquote conserved by white savior complexes. And I think that that needs to be addressed if we're really going to do this in an ethical and just manner to protect the planet, um, then the power and the control and the resources need to be put into indigenous hands, because obviously we've been doing it right for so long. Wonderful. Thanks, Kelsey. I am conscious I forgot to put in the targets for you to guess what Kelsey was would be talking about, but she, of course, addressed um, target three in particular around 30 by 30, but importantly also target 21, which was brought about despite the limitations of the convention itself, but brought about because of the International Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity, the importance of UNDRIP is included still in, in bracketed text, um, but it is currently there under the global biodiversity framework. And that to me speaks also to the way in which indigenous communities are exercising um, th their sovereign rights um, in these fora, even though there's, there's so much more to do. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Now, Alexandra will be talking Sorry, Emmanuel, sorry, I've got my alphabet mixed up. Um, Emmanuel will also be talking about an area of law that one could say isn't sufficiently addressed in the global biodiversity framework. It does have, and this is your hint, it does have its own protocol. So the issues that Emmanuel will be talking about links nicely to one of the other um, biodiversity protocols. Feel free to guess what that is in the chat box or shout it at the computer, but over to you, Emmanuel. Uh, thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, what I want to really discuss with you is um, regulating gen 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 genetically modified organisms in Africa. Because as Michelle has said, this is already under the Katana protocol, of course, which is a supplement to the convention on CBD, when of course you look at the Katagana protocol, that's the international instrument which provides a number of measures, uh, you know, a precaution of measures such as um, risk assessment, risk management, handling, transport, packaging, labeling, labeling, capacity building, all which are geared to uh, geared at, at, at protecting human animals and the environment. However, when we are dealing with GMOs. Because as you know, Africa is actually facing um, a food uh, you know, shortage. And um, because of climate change, population growth, also growth. and um, as a result, there is an argument that um, GMOs are a solution. But when you look at GMOs, they also have their challenge because um, when you look at uh, some people ask that um, transgenic crops um, with aid farmers uh, in inducing burden of best drought and improve yields and quality with limited costs and efforts. Um, but then when you look at some countries, they have already started planting um, you know, GMOs, for example, South Africa, Sudan, Egypt, the Faso, and others actually are planning to do so. However, the concerns are that um, these GMOs uh, will actually affect um, the environment and human safety. Um, uh, there are, the challenge is that there's no regulatory framework. First, um, um, there's no regulatory framework, uh, which is effective at the, at the African level, but also when you go to some countries, you'll find that there's, the, the, the regulatory framework is very weak that does not protect uh, levels of human and, and animal health and the environment, see? And at the same time, even the Katekana protocol, in some cases, as Christian was saying, is not domesticated. So at the end of the day, Africa is in trouble. We want the GMOs, but we don't regulate them. So, uh, so that is the issue really I want to, you know, to discuss with you. How do we regulate GMOs in Africa effectively so that it doesn't affect um, you know, our human safety doesn't affect our environment. 
Thank you, Michelle. Thanks so much, Emmanuel. And in many ways, what you speak to is also the range of competing issues, I suppose, that occur in the global biodiversity framework, but also um, under the convention's objectives itself, itself and how to address at the global level these important issues of justice, linking to, to what um, Kelsey was saying as well. And then also other legal issues around principles such as precaution. Thanks so much, Emmanuel. We'll move now to Claudia. And for those of you guessing at home, Claudia's expertise links also to Target 21, but it's also an overarching issue that is peppered through at different places across the global biodiversity framework. Can you guess what it is? If not, Claudia is here to tell you all about it. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Thank you. I would like to start with a quote of Wangari Maathai, who, as you know, is the first African woman to win a Nobel Peace Prize. And I think she was visionary in the sense that she was very clear on how peace, human rights, and linking with the gender equality specifically of those women in rural areas was critical. So I think when we're talking about how do we bring transformative change at the global level, it's really important to keep these nexus to the very uh, local initiatives that at the end of the game are very much driving uh, these transformative change, although often they are not uh, seen. And I think this comes to the issue of the potential of the right to a healthy environment, which was, as we know, recognized by the UN General Assembly this year and was a result of decades of many duty bearers, right holders uh, pushing for this right. And I think in the context of the Convention of Biological Diversity, we have seen advances, especially in terms of information and public participation of indigenous people and local communities, although they have not been framed as rights, which this is important, as I will touch upon later on. However, when we're talking about incorporating the right to a healthy environment and incorporating a human rights-based approach, it goes further than that. It goes to really thinking about how do we implement the human rights principle of accountability and the rule of law, for example. And we see that the Biodiversity Convention, we haven't been good at that. None of the IG targets was fully complied with. So what does it tell us about the environmental rule of law and the human rights accountability when it comes to commitment that states have set for themselves? So I think here again, human rights has a lot to offer also in terms of its accountability mechanisms. We could have liked to see much more advances when it comes to, to the adoption of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework when it came to uh, strong mechanisms of review and implementation. We see that there's a lot to learn from human rights law, although of course there are many things that are still having to be worked further, but in terms of the universal peer review mechanism or other mechanisms, especially within the context of environmental democracy, the now newly adopted uh, Eskasu agreement, which, which has a very strong uh, mechanism of implementation and compliance that still needs to be in place. But I mean, its rules of procedures are very strong or the Iris Convention. Uh, the Eskasu agreement, as we know, has a regional and a Caribbean focus, while the Iris Convention, although it started being a European focus, it's open for all states. So what I want to highlight here is that when we're talking about incorporating this uh, human rights based approach is really crucial for complying with the three objectives of the Convention of Biological Diversity, conservation, sustainable use and benefit sharing and really putting a spotlight on those in the front line of conservation, sustainable use, which are environmental human rights defenders, and putting a spotlight in their situation, which is risky. And at the same time, they bring huge contributions 
to these goals that we're hoping for. And I think so far, the Convention of Biological Diversity has been very shy in really standing up and speaking upfront about the challenges they are facing and about ways in which we can collectively support their work, which is benefiting not only their communities, but us and also future generations. Thanks so much, Claudia. I think you speak to a really important point because a lot of the discussion, narrative discourse around the global biodiversity framework has been very much about the content of issues that are being discussed and there needs to be so much more engagement with actual issues of implementation. So often I don't get this sense of hope when talking about biodiversity issues, but what your work does in terms of speaking to me is how that there are other mechanisms. The important thing here is that the Global Biodiversity Framework and the CBD links more to, to those other mechanisms that you just spoke about. Let's move now to ICE, who is on the ground in Montreal. And again, if you're following on along at home, I would guess that ICE's particular target would be around target 13, but I'll let her tell you a bit more about that, but feel free to guess what that is about. Well, 13 is a great target, but I mainly deal with target nine these days. And um, well, in any case, everything is very much interconnected. I think all the issues that have already been mentioned by, by, by our colleagues here are very much interlinked and interconnected. And I think one of the issues that I want to deal with today uh, and what I'm dealing with on a daily basis, which is, you know, leaving me with some sleepless nights, is the fact that we are talking about something that is of dire importance of our lives, biodiversity. We're talking about how biodiversity is our life and it's our food, it's our medicine, it's everything that we have, we own and we make and everything that results in providing us resilience. And we're still talking about an instrument which is very much the underdog of international law. It's still not as popular as, as, as mentioned as climate change. None of the world leaders join to these conventions, uh, to, to these conferences of the parties and not discuss this. But at the same time, there is another massive elephant in the room, which is that there's a huge issue of inequity and inequality when it comes to biodiversity in the world. There is one part of the world which is known as more the technologically and scientifically advanced part is using the other part of the world's biodiversity which is known the biodiversity rich part. I'm talking about global north and the global south and today still to this day and historically also there has been inequality in terms of who gets to use these resources and who gets to benefit from them and who gets to conserve these resources and who takes uh, those resources from those who are conserving those resources. Now, we have historically had these conversations which led to the adoption of Convention on Biological Diversity and which led to us discussing this, these issues in a three pillar objective, the conservation, sustainable use and benefit sharing, which are very much interlinked and interconnected. But then there's a third part, the benefit sharing, which it has not delivered as much as we hoped it was going to be delivering. And now still to this day in the global biodiversity framework, we are talking about benefit sharing as if it's one of the small nitty gritty tiny things. Now it's one of the three pillars of our objectives. And when you look at the uh, zero draft of global biodiversity framework, you see that the global biodiversity framework mentions the theory of change. And it say, says that the theory of change means that the current system of what, how we're dealing with things is not working at the moment. And in order to get to where we want to get, which is talking about living in harmony with nature, one of the key elements is benefit sharing. But when you look at all the goals and the targets of the global biodiversity framework, benefit sharing is very seldom mentioned and it's always connected to benefit sharing of genetic resources or utilization of genetic resources and associated traditional knowledge. That is a very, very, very tiny part of using biodiversity. We're not talking about bio trade. We're not talking about any other extractive uses of biodiversity. We're not talking about 
benefit sharing in a way in which we are making sure we're sharing those benefits with those who are conserving biodiversity. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm referencing Kelsey here uh, on the indigenous peoples and local communities stewardship of nature conservation. And when we're talking about living in harmony with nature, how many of us can say in the global north or, or, or more in the um, technologically and scientifically advanced part of the world that we are living in harmony with nature? Perhaps we have so much more to learn about how to live in a reciprocal relationship with nature with those who have been for centuries sustaining themselves living in those reciprocal relationships. And I think we need to look at benefit sharing in a more holistic approach, including so much more of a human rights based approach, as Claudia mentioned, because human rights, human needs and biodiversity are inseparable. They're very much interlinked and interconnected. We are biodiversity. We come from biodiversity and we thrive in biodiversity. That's key to our survival. And at the moment, we are controlling so much of biodiversity that it is it has become its survival has become key to it's we have been using so much biodiversity that we are key in its survival so we need to think about all of these things when we're talking about benefit sharing and not just a nitty-gritty little part of uh, genetic resources and associated traditional knowledge thanks so much Isa. and when you were talking in many ways i was hearing the values the ipa's values assessment in the back of my mind you're talking about be benefits you're talking about values but what you highlight is that there's more to nature, there's more to our relationships with nature than what we can extract from it. There's more than a monetary value of nature and the importance of recognizing, yes, intrinsic values, but relational values as well, so critically important. Thank you. Let's move now to Alexandra. And if you're, again, guessing along at home, don't feel shy if you get the wrong target as I did just then with ICE. But I'm pretty sure that the target most related to Alexandra's expertise is around target seven, even though her particular issue area might still be in brackets. I'm not sure about that, but uh, go ahead, Alexandra. No, I think you're absolutely correct. And it, it really does focus on target seven, but also, Target seven in the context more broadly of the entirety of the GBF. Um, and <clears throat> coming from the perspective of plastics and looking at it as the task force chair, um, what is fascinating to me and what I think we do need to see a bit more discussion of, and I'm hoping for more discussion of as we get towards the end of the week in Montreal, is an understanding of how we mesh the issue of biodiversity damage and loss and threat with the causes and the drivers of that, that include human and man-made drivers, especially in the plastics field. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm losing my voice a little bit. But um, when we were in the negotiation session, the first negotiation session for the plastics treaty several weeks ago, there was a very heavy emphasis while biodiversity itself and the biodiversity convention didn't come up as much in the discussions. Um, especially in the, the convergence issues. Certainly the states that were giving their own statements and comments throughout the week were consistently raising biodiversity as an issue and biodiversity damage as an issue, especially small island states and many of the LDCs where they have a lot of issues from plastics washing up and coming into their environment, causing a great deal of damage, but not being involved in the creation or the disposal of those plastics. They are the end um, downstream receivers. They're not the ones who are actually creating the problem. And so their stress really was on trying to find upstream solutions for this, as well as addressing the downstream problem, mentioning, but not necessarily creating the, the express link that we do need to make in both regimes between biodiversity and the protection of biodiversity at the international level, because this type of Pollution is indeed a transboundary issue. It's an international issue. And the way that we regulate at home, as well as the way that we think of the biodiversity, um, especially 
convention, especially the framework working um, in the future to address things like all forms of pollution, not just plastics pollution, but all forms of pollution at the same time that we link it to emerging norms coming out of, for example, the plastics treaty. So it's really fascinating. And I think an early point of study, both because we have hopefully the, the GBF coming out in its final form quite soon, and then several years before we have a plastics treaty to see how they will be forming each other and interacting with each other. And certainly that is one of the positions that we have taken on the task force and that uh, WCL has supported us with quite, quite profoundly is the need for regime interaction to make sure that we're not overwhelming the issues um, from different sides, we're not coming at them from different points of view that will put too much pressure on states as they're trying to respond or they're unable to respond to one without having issues with the other. And also making sure as many of the, uh, the other speakers have talked about issues with equity and uh, justice issues that we don't overwhelm ministries, we don't overwhelm the resource systems that are there by failing to recognize the relationships that already exist and how we might broaden them um, and how we might have had them play off, although they are in different treaty regimes. So thank you, Michelle. Thanks so much, Alexandra. And I think in many ways, what you're highlighting is you can implement the GBF. And if you sign up to the plastics treaty, you're 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 doing you're implementing your legal obligations under exactly. that as well and, and I like what a, a lot about what you're saying in the importance of highlighting to state how single actions can actually be interconnected to implementing a range of existing obligations and the importance of recognizing where those interlinkages are not only across um, multilateral environmental agreements but other equity human rights um, law uh, international obligations as well. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank and you. given that we're now going in That's right, we're flipping. order again, I'll come back to you, Alexandra. Um, yes. Take us through, which in some ways you have already, what are some, well, give us one key challenge or, or roadblock that you see as part of this process. So it's actually quite fascinating. Um, listening to the discussions yesterday that were going on in, in various side events um, at the COP, and then obviously knowing in the context of the Plastics Treaty, I think one of the, the key roadblocks, interestingly, is the definition and the idea of what we're talking about. Certainly in the plastics context, we have a great deal of questions coming up already as to how do we define plastics themselves? How do we define sub, you know, what are microplastics, what are macroplastics, etc. cetera? Um, <clears throat> but there were also a number of discussions yesterday about how do we define um, various aspects of the GBF? How do we make sure that there are sufficient scientific definitions as well as legal definitions informing what goes into the GBF and how it is put in place? So I think one roadblock that we are all coming to face as we're trying to develop new and very meaningful either treaty regimes or frameworks that build off existing law and then take it further is the idea of what we're defining the problem as, and then how we're seeking to find a solution based on that set of definitions, um, which is quite fascinating. And I think kind of shows how most of the MEAs we are now working with have evolved to the point where they are very specific and they are often very technical. And sometimes for lawyers, understanding that the technicality can be quite difficult if we're not necessarily um, blessed with a scientific background, but it does create a really strong core of important issues that we'll have to look at in the future, um, which means many of us get to find out more about our sub areas than we ever thought we would need to know. <laughs> we'll never look at a plastic bottle again. I've already told Christina, my husband is, is like very angry that I will never be able to allow him to bring a plastic bottle in the house again, but that's a different story <laughs> for a different day. <laughs> But at the same time, I'm imagining the scientists now coming to to work with lawyers and going, yeah. oh, their words and their commas. Well, it's actually, it's quite funny. In the, the meeting that I've just been attending, there was a discussion about, from the scientific perspective, some people who attended um, the, the INC for the Plastics Treaty, who are you know, very excellent scientists, never having worked with lawyers before and never having fully understood that we will argue about the placement of a comma 
um, or whether it's a comma or a semicolon or something like that. So it is really actually quite refreshing to get that perspective, um, often to remind us of, of how very specialized we are in our, our framework. Um, when it goes well, obviously, it's a quite a powerful alliance. And it's something that IUCN in particular is very good at fostering because mm -hmm. of the scientific commission's work, as well as the secretariat and also WCEL. Um, it's just a question of how you make sure those people talk to each other and we bridge those fields quite well. Nice, thanks. Let's move move to ICE. In some ways you, you've highlighted what, but um, take us back to what are some of the key challenges around issues of equitably sharing the range of wonderful things that come from nature? Oh, I think I'm also going to piggyback from Alexandra's comments about uh, issues being too technical sometimes and mm. and lawyers and scientists trying to communicate. Well, uh, the, the, the most uh, interesting issue for mo many at the moment when it comes to benefit sharing is how we will solve the, uh, the, the question of digital sequence information. Mm. And there we also have the issue of um, natural scientists communicating their needs and uh, other stakeholders communicating their needs and then indigenous peoples and local communities communicating their rights and needs. And here we have the issue of who's most vocal, who can actually understand the issue and situation. And oftentimes it's natural scientists that end up explaining to us you know, how it works, but at the same time, um, so we have established recently uh, a team called Interdisciplinary DSI so that we can also look at social issues and uh, legal issues and environmental justice issues surrounding digital sequence information and also transdisciplinary issues. So beyond academia, because sometimes you have rights holders and stakeholders that are not part of academia and they need to be involved in this conversation as well. And uh, one of our members, Adam McCarthy from the Uni University of Manchester, his research is based on uh, how much publication on DSI has been done and from which disciplines. And it's quite overwhelmingly dominatingly natural sciences. And lawyers don't look at this issue as much as natural scientists do, but we end up regulating it. Hmm. And I think we are missing a lot of questions when we're, like, when we're talking about digital sequence information, we're missing out on a lot of issues related to justice, equity, fairness, environmental justice and all the all the historical contexts that resulted in us being here today and I think that's also one of the one of the challenges that end up in the negotiation rooms because then we talk about the whole again very technical details about digital sequence information which are of course very important but then I think uh, it's important to also remember why we're doing these things and what we want to really achieve. Thank you. Like you always think of these negotiations as, you know, um, different blocks of state parties, et cetera, et cetera. But what you're both highlighting is then there's also that need for communication across a range of disciplines, but also rights holders. Thank you. Claudia. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of thinking about these uh, huge challenges, one of the key challenges that I see is that there is an acknowledgement that we need sustainability transformations. And we see that repeated again and again by the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and yet, what we see when we see the actual steps that are being taken, and uh, the extent which they are reinforcing the status quo, or they are really being transformative, one could ask themselves. I remember being in Nagoya, where the IT targets were being negotiated and finally adopted. And I was so excited. I was just like, wow, we, we are here in the middle of deciding biodiversity law. It's global. It's going to change the world. I think you muted yourself. 
we lost you at Change the World. Okay. <laughs> I'm Latin America, so I need to sp speak with my hands, but then that's the that's the challenge together. No, but as I was saying, as I went to the next COP, then I became like more you know, we were realistic of what COPs could actually achieve. And of course, we try our best. We advise the CBD secretariat, parties, other stakeholders, for instance, in the adoption of the Convention of Biological Diversity guidelines on safeguards in biodiversity financing mechanisms to think about like really the economic drivers that are also behind these and how human rights and safeguards need to be there. I think now, like, more than 10 years after the IG targets, I see that what we achieve through these global processes, it's very important, it's necessary, but it's not at all sufficient. So I think something that we haven't been done sufficiently is to really put on our intersectionality lenses to really thinking thoroughly of which are these intersecting forms of vulnerability and privilege. And I think intersectionality has been really good at highlighting kind of the negative side of like these intersections and how do they operate generating negative impacts. I think we should be looking more at how these interacting forms can really and are also in practice generating transformative solutions. And here I'm thinking about not only framing men, like women in rural areas or children in the global South or migrants, indigenous people as vulnerable, because you, you keep on seeing that. And sometimes that vulnerability is equated to weakness and powerlessness. So I think in terms of thinking about this really transformative change, I think if we really were embedding a gender equality approach, that would be transformative. If we were in seeing and supporting really these uh, actors that are seen as vulnerable, and in many ways they are as transformative agents as we see with environmental human rights defenders. I feel that there's a lot of scope in there of really supporting environmental democracy, information, participation, truly access to justice to really achieve these other substantive goals of the Biodiversity Convention. So yes, the post-2020 global biodiversity framework will be important, but let's not be naive. The process needs much more ground up work and really challenge this powerful economic interest if we want a truly transformative post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Thanks so much, Claudia. What I always love about your work is how it, it using the language of transformation, it changes that narrative around moving beyond so-called deficit models and changes narratives around who needs to be, who should be the agents of transformation, as you put it. Thank you so much. Let's move now to Emmanuel. What are some of the key challenges, roadblocks when it comes to GMOs, particularly on the African continent? Yes, thank you, Michelle. I will highlight three challenges uh, related to the development of the regulatory framework. Uh, the first one is that this, uh, I have already said the appearance uh, related to safety, human beings, the environment, also the issue of intellectual property rights, spread biodiversity, and as a result, uh, the NGO are all being actually that um, uh, we don't actually introduce, you know, GMOs, which means you cannot you cannot develop what you can't you can't develop a regulation when people don't want. Even last week on the 29th uh, November, the High Court in Kenya uh, ruled that um, the of GMOs should be suspended. Actually, they are making process against. Um, uh, Bill Gates, that we don't want that, we don't want that. So you can see that's a challenge, the opposition, you know, uh, of, 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 of introducing GMOs. Then the other concern is that uh, GMOs crops would repress conventional variety. Therefore, the, the, the farmers would depend on private seed companies, for example, uh, the buyer, 
who will have the resource to control food supplies. And this will interfere with the role of indigenous farmers as custodian of agricultural biodiversity. So that's uh, another challenge that uh, there. And the other challenge is that there is still limited capacity of many African countries to undertake research and effectively monitor and evaluate the impact of GM products and um, to biodiversity. Now, of course, when you have no capacity, then how do you regulate? You cannot regulate what you don't know. So that's still a challenge because there is limited capacity of the, of the African really are experts. And the concern is that you cannot regulate what you don't know. So that, those are the three challenges that um, I raise. In other words, uh, like the last one that people cannot talk of having an appropriate regulatory framework, and people don't have capacity to monitor and research, you know, and evaluate the impact of GMO products. Thank you. Thanks so much. And I think in many ways, what you're talking to is how things are sometimes framed as these techno solutions in many ways and, and linking to what Claudia was saying, linking to how it then takes away from existing systems on issues so fundamental, such as access to food, but then also linking to other aspects of, of the natural world. Thanks, Emmanuel, and we go now to Kelsey. Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, I agree with everything you know. My my co panelists have shared so far this morning. I think you know to you know what I shared earlier in terms of recognition of indigenous rights and having conservation efforts be indigenous led. I think to empower that and ensure that that is written within the body of the law, we um, need to have alignment, as I mentioned earlier, with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, particularly Article 32, which calls for free, prior, and informed consent. And we're not seeing that type of language constructed within the global biodiversity framework or within, you know, any type of revisions that could be um, negotiated for um, a revisioning of the CBD um, or a new document or new agreements, you know, any type of biodiversity agreement should have um, free prior and informed consent listed and should have the protection of Indigenous rights listed, um, particularly, as I mentioned earlier, with the concerns around 30 by 30, um, that these projects, these, um, these projects labeled as conservation efforts by the Global North um, really could be put into situations that disadvantage or take away the rights of Indigenous peoples. Um, and and I think there's also a bit of, of smoke and mirrors happening. Um, you know, you can have, and that's why you saw at, at COP15, Indigenous peoples, um, you know, disrupt uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's opening speech. You can't be funding the tar sands at a pipeline and then also say, but we're going to give money to the Global South to fund their biodiversity conservation efforts. It is, you know, horrifically violent to be a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um, and that's what we're seeing, you know, be enacted by the global North. And so I think that firstly has to be addressed. And then I also think it the, ele the other elephant in the room is as human beings, we cannot put forward the rights and needs of nature without actually recognizing that nature has rights. Um, you can't protect biodiversity without a recognition of the rights of nature, um, without the recognition of the inherent rights of Mother Earth. Um, and I think we're starting to see that, um, you know, colleagues at Earth Law Center, Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature, there was a, a really strong contingent of folks actively participating at COP15. Um, and working to and make sure that those principles would be embedded in the framework moving forward. But they face a lot of resistance, resistance from uh, countries like Japan and Argentina and, and others. And I think it speaks to how there is still um, a gross human failure to say one thing, but actually do another. If our intent is to protect biodiversity, to protect non-human beings, then rights of nature is a simple answer to the challenge. Wonderful, thank you. When you were talking about smokes and mirrors, a very and I very much agree that that's what's happening here. You see that um, in terms of 
every 10 years in Australia, there's, there's a report on the federal environmental legislation. And this new report comes out saying, seemingly talking um, something beneficial for uh, Indigenous people, but it talks about even the language that it's using. It's, it's about harnessing Indigenous knowledge rather than involving, empowering Indigenous leadership. And when you were talking about Smokes and Mirrors, I was also thinking very much about the work of Professor Irene Watson, how she refers to this Muldabi, which is this shape-shifting demon, and how she refers to how that it, that demon appears very much in this continued colonization, but also the language that is used to pretend to do something, but actually not actually getting to the issue. Thank you so much. So we've so-called been talking about challenges and roadblocks, but in many ways in talking about that, you, you've all very nicely weaved in what potential solutions are. So what are the ways forward? And who would like to start by taking us forward? It looks like ICE is ready. I'll go to you, ICE. Yeah, I when when Kelsey was speaking, I wasn't back in the camera just doing this. <laughs> <laughs> just very much agreeing with her. Um, I'm very much respecting her opinion on this. Um, so indeed, when we're talking about, you know, uh, sharing benefits uh, between global north, global south, or 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 between, you know, in even in the global north uh, countries, between uh, countries and indigenous communities, um, benefit sharing is not about just about money. We can't just talk about money and we can't just say, okay, we have all the power to make decisions. We will do everything as we want to do, but we will just pay you for it. And that's not how, that's not how problems are solved. That's not how transformative change happens. Benefit sharing is also very much interconnected with land rights. It's very much interconnected with recognition. It's very much interconnected with uh, the authority to determine what's going to happen to, to the resources of indigenous land. And indeed, if, if a country is delving into indigenous land and making decisions on behalf of indigenous peoples, giving money thereafter is, is no use, absolutely no use. And when it comes to access and benefit sharing in a NAGO protocol, the GO Protocol preamble directly refers to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and says nothing in this law should be going, uh, should be should be against the rights of the Yundrip. Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk about the whole discussions related to digital sequence information, none of the Indigenous Peoples community, Indigenous Peoples representatives are allowed in the room. So how are you supposed to be checking in with, uh, with the states whether your rights are being effectively protected under international law if you cannot be in the room? So that's one thing. Right now, uh, most of the negotiations going on about, uh, about, the, about DSI, digital sequence information, is going on in the Friends of the Chair. But Friends of the Chair historically has been an, uh, a place in which you are addressing a very much of a conflict between two or three states. But right now, it's all about the entirety of the negotiations and none of the stakeholders or IPLCs are involved in that. Now, that makes it very difficult for IPLCs to, to deal with an issue that directly is applicable to them, to their lands, to their resources, to their knowledge. And then I'm going to also talk about a sort of comment on, the, on what you said about, uh, you know, uh, I can't remember your word, but talking about traditional knowledge and sort of uh, embodying traditional knowledge, is that what you said? Um, in, in Australian legislation, oh, that was the word. Harnessing, harnessing Indigenous knowledge. Do you harnessing mean? Indigenous knowledge, indeed. Maybe that's not what Indigenous peoples and local communities want. Why, why, do, why, do, the, why do we think that uh, if we harness Indigenous knowledge and ways of being and philosophy and ecovision, such as rights to nature into the Western philosophy, then we solve the whole problem. No, the issue is indigenous peoples not being empowered to do this autonomously by themselves, for themselves, and us learning from indigenous peoples instead of taking more knowledge from indigenous peoples 
And to me, that is what benefit sharing should be about. It should be about the reciprocity. If we're saying, and if we are agreeing to the fact that the indigenous peoples are conserving biodiversity globally, then we have a reciprocal obligation to indigenous peoples as our kins that are conserving the life for us. Thanks so much, Ice. And I have a sense that Claudia is going to come in and build on what you've both been talking about. Claudia. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I like to be a bit provocative now. So I could like to ask more of a question that I, I, I don't have an answer myself. And it's the one on this narrative between the divide between the global south and global north. And something that uh, I pose myself the question is whether that's diverting our attention from other divides that are even more important. And it's the clash of values. The clash of values doesn't matter if you're in the global south or the global north, but whether you're interested in caring for that diversity of life, of culture, that for instance, scientists, both in the global south and global north have this curiosity to understand how nature contributions to people operate and how that supports, for instance, food systems. So again, indigenous people in the global south and global north really converge with that, as opposed to those uh, who prioritize fast for profit economic benefits and so on. So because you find huge inequalities in the global north and the global south. And, and it's, it's kind of putting us apart, those who are prioritizing the first set of values than bringing us together. And I think this links to some discussion that uh, Christina, you were putting forward in, in, uh, in one of the conferences that was, okay, to what extent we need a more kind of uh, problematize of how we understand the principle of common and differentiated responsibilities. And if possible, it'd be great to hear from you. And, um, and to move forward from there, it's like whether the principle of solidarity is one that allows us to try to understand and go beyond these dichotomies between global so North and South to understanding how solidarity between states, but also among right holders and between North and South and between South and South, it'd be further fostered. So more of a question and uh, I'm very keen to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks, Claudia. Christina, would you like to respond? <laughs> I'm happy to, but I'm also very happy listening to this very, very interesting conversation in general but I, I had some thoughts when you were you know your previous question on the stumbling blocks what are the roadblocks that we're currently seeing and I think one of them is indeed what Claudia is alluding to is is kind of the the bifurcation of the system putting you know one part of the world against the other and 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 I have to agree with, with Claudia that this is absolutely not not helpful and maybe the dividing lines go somewhere else and we should think about differentiation when no doubt about it states are different all of them have different national circumstances national capabilities but in my view it doesn't really help that much to put the world in two boxes and you know have have them kind of fight fight that out um, and we see that very clearly on the issue of resource mobilization. You asked about stumbling blocks, and that that's the you know the biggest one currently where we've seen walkouts and and you know the stopping of the negotiations entirely and being sent to ministers for for resolution because no no possibility was found in the in the technical negotiations. So I think thinking around how to recognize differences between countries, um, and and national uh, um, considerations, but without necessarily building uh, building to to you know a, a bifurcated world that we haven't really had in the context of the CBD. We don't have the, the the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities in the context of the CBD. Uh, it's not mentioned anywhere, different from the climate climate convention. So it's been introduced in a way to maybe undermine. Um, strong 
longer uh, um, uh, framework, but I think it's it's worthwhile thinking about how differentiation can be done in a way that's fair, that's equitable, but also leads to an effective agreement, and that should be at the core of what uh, needs to come out of of, uh, of Montreal. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks so much, Christina. I think I will go to Emmanuel now because I think the work that Emmanuel does links very nicely to what Claudio was talking about, but also Christina's point about, in particular, it feels like this idea of, of values, Claudia mentioned food systems, how it plays out in different parts of the world. Feel free to share with us on that point or other things in terms of ways forward um, that you see from your perspective. Thank you, Michelle. The way forward is, um, okay, it's more or less related to what they're saying. Is for example, um, in terms of regulating GMOs uh, in Africa is to implement African Model law on biosafety that was adopted um, by African Union in 2003 because it provides a unique opportunity for governments in Africa to introduce national uh, biosafety regulation that mm. are designed to broad and unified continental framework. In other words, the argument is that um, uh, instead of you know domes domesticating um, the Katagana protocol. It will be easier to use the framework that has been developed within the African context and which allows the countries you know, to appreciate what they need to do and how they do it. And again, it, it promotes acceptability by African nations that this is our instrument, uh, which of course relates to the debate between the, the North and the South, because you see the argument is that maybe. Katena, Katagana protocol, though of course it is from Katagana, but you see it is discussed, it is negotiated, you know, by the, by the North. And then the, the African model is negotiated by people in Africa from the South, which of course um, will promote uh, acceptability in terms of, um, you know, development and implementation. So until that is done, debates will continue. And then uh, we have GMOs, which will come, of course, um, illegally. And when something comes illegally, it's more dangerous because it's not regulated, the standards are not ensured. So the fear now of human safety will increase, you know, uh, and also on the environment will increase. So it will be dangerous to have something that is not regulated than have something that is regulated uh, with at least specific uh, standards. Thank you, Michelle. That is my contribution. Thanks so much, Emmanuel. Dangerous, but also completely unjust um, in, um, to, to do things in, in that particular way. And then I think for, for many, in many ways, it's a dual level of acceptability, right? Both in terms of governments, but also in terms of citizens. I'll go to Alexandra now, because what you talk about is another area of potential turf wars, not in terms of countries, but in terms of institutions and um, instruments. Or feel free to talk us through other ways forward that you see in this space. Uh, no, I, I think it's it, what is also fascinating is that as much as we do think of um, many treaty regimes as being very territorial in the sense of being really focused on their own issues and their own topics. Um, there is a broader understanding now that mm -hmm. not only for economic reasons and reasons of time expediency, but also just very much practical reasons, there is a need to have multiple um, discussions, multiple regimes talking with each other and working with each other. And this actually was a theme even yesterday in so many of the biodiversity um, COP meetings. And I think that it is really fascinating to see this evolution of knowing the need for discussion, which is a very valuable lesson to move forward. And understanding that as much as we do need to have separate regimes to regulate specific issues, specific areas, um, sometimes even regional issues which are and agreements which are more powerful for their implementation abilities, they all do need to come together and they all do need to talk together um, in a way that for many of us, who you know 
I don't want to disclose how many years I've been working in this, but for many of us who've been working in this type of space for a while, we're not used to seeing when we came into it. And it really was much more siloed in many ways. And this growth of understanding, which is a scientifically led as well as a legally led um, understanding, because now that we have more scientific facts, now that we have IPCC and IPAS reports that really do focus us on where the areas of coalescence are, we're then able to talk more and understand how we can bring things together. So for example, yesterday there were discussions in some of the side events um, and the contact groups about potentially creating um, agreement areas and uh, areas of overlap discussions and committees, et cetera. So you would bring different treaty regimes together, um, which is very much hopeful. It's very much hopeful. It's very much novel. Whether it works, I, I cannot say. Right? What, what happens when people get into a room? I don't know. Um, but just the fact that they're in a room is very different than what we would usually have assumed to have happened. And that type of collaboration was much more novel and looked at very strangely. Um, for example, things like the Codex Elementarius and some of the overlaps between ILO and FAO, which happened for years, were much more unusual. And this is this is a really good thing. It's a very positive thing for understanding the specific issues in the environmental law context, but also the broader issues and how they relate to each other. So I always try to be hopeful. I always try to find something useful. I don't know. <laughs> but it's so sensible as well. Like, why wouldn't you? But it's really great that the sensible <laughs> is happening. Sometimes it doesn't win. So, you know, this is a good thing when it does. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to, to Kelsey for the final word in this part of the segment in terms of um, all of us panelists talking to everyone, but um, what are some of the ways forward? And once you've responded to that, it, what you've been talking about already links very nicely to a question that we have come through from Andy Rain, who asks, generally to the panel, but I think you're probably one of the best people to answer this, how rights of nature could be effectively integrated into the GPF? Wonderful. Um, yeah, solutions are, are hard. Um, you know, I think, I think particularly for me, solutions are difficult because I'm not in a position of power. Um, and I know my co-panelists have shared this, you know, previously, that there are a lot of constraints in terms of the power dynamics that shape how these conversations occur and who has access, who gets to be a decision maker. Um, and you probably can count on one hand how many of those decision makers are Indigenous, and maybe the hands, the fingers don't even go up. Um, so it, it it leaves you a bit sort of disheartened um, by the entirety of, of these processes. Um, the fact that Indigenous youth even have to stand up before, you know, all of the parties convening in Montreal and, and be disruptive because it's being passed on to another generation is disheartening. Um, so I don't necessarily know what that says about solutions. I think it says that everybody needs to maybe do some self-reflection um, and really ask themselves what are they working towards and who are they working um, for? And that who being inclusive of also the natural world. And I think that shifts to um, and, and Andrea Andy's question um, on, you know, on, on rights of nature. And I would I would just turn folks to, you know, to my colleagues um, at the Earth Law Center. They've put together a wonderful briefing packet um, on the CBD and on uh, the um, global biodiversity framework basically highlighting that under targets 11 and targets 15, that there would begin bracketed um, these spaces for, you know, rights of nature, uh, rights of Mother Earth, um, and that it would um, fit very well within those targets um, to begin to start to um, institutionalize those principles within um, our broader work for biodiversity. But 
Again, I would love to see, and I think they've also advocated for this, um, and, and they put out a report last year, so you can go to their website, earthlawcenter.org, and read the report on how they um, have identified particular strategies for integration of rights of nature and earth law more broadly across the framework. Um, but I think it also needs to be more prominent than sort of tagged on to the end of a target. I mean, um, a, a target in and of itself, preamble work a declaratory statement. Um, I think world leaders really need to be more, more fervent and firm in, in this approach and in adoption of uh, rights of nature mechanisms. And, you know, I will say how I can contribute. I'm, you know, I'm an excellent researcher and I've been a part of excellent research teams. And one area that we're really proud of right now is the development of a global tracker for different types of legal mechanisms that prioritize rights of nature and earth law more broadly, which is the eco jurisprudence monitor. Um, you can search by your political jurisdiction, but also by ecological actor. And that's at ecojurisprudence.org. And so I feel like that's tools are also helpful to solutions building and to finding your people and your network of how to be able to scale up resources um, and learn from one another because we don't do enough listening um, to be able to really make sustainable change. Thanks, Kelsey. And Claudia uh, also has uh, a lot of experience in this area and particularly the area of the world where there is a lot of discussion of, of rights of nature. Claudia. I think in terms of this, uh, where do we learn from? And mm. I think there's a lot of talk how uh, Global South should be learning from the Global North when it comes, for instance, uh, when you're talking about the Eskatsu Agreement, oh, there's a lot to learn from the Aris Convention. And I could like to prompt the other way around. Of course, there's a lot to learn in that direction, but there's a lot to learn also in the other direction. How can the Global North learn from the Global South? And I think uh, to the question of the rights to nature, I would like to really point out to some jurisprudence that it's happening in the Global South, specifically in Colombia, where the rights of nature is very much weaved together with constitutional rights with the right to a healthy environment, with the right to life and others. For instance, if you look at the case of uh, the Atrato River, uh, which uh, I think is very progressive in terms of recognizing nature rights, but very much linking it to the rights of Afro-descendant communities, indigenous people, and so on. Because I think that link is very important. If we start seeing nature rights as debated, from those in the territories that have these cultural connections, I think we have risks there uh, of more tensions as opposed to more synergies. Mm, and, and just wanted to, I mean, to, to your question also in terms of where do we see hope? I would just like to highlight two actors that are often not seen enough, their contributions. One, local governments. There's huge work by local governments that don't go to COPs, don't present on side events, and yet they are the closest to people and the closest to the governance of nature. You far, we have, for example, C40, that it's a, a network of uh, mayors, and their focus is framed as climate change. But if you look at their commitments, they are very much biodiversity, nature contributions to people, values. So again, uh, Colombia is an example, they're integrating climate considerations and environmental issues into land use planning. And it's a, a commitment for from 2019 and for 12 years. So I think there's a lot of hope there. And also for instance, the open uh, government partnership with more than 106 local governments focusing on procedural rights, information participation to enable the realization of other rights. So that's one. And the other one I want to get go into detail because I know we don't have time, but another actor that I think that's potentially very transformative, and again, it's doing a work that might not get to the headlines of news, but it's national human rights institutions, which are independent institutions mandated often by the constitution who have a budget, but are independent from the state and are also very much close to civil society, but are still an independent institution. Uh, some call them ombudsperson. You have ombudsperson for children, ombudsperson 
for future generations. And they are doing an enormous work, sometimes not really framed as biodiversity, but it's uh, very transformative in the way that they conduct, for instance, uh, public inquiries in Indonesia, for example. So I would like to prompt you in those two directions that are not sufficiently seen and where we can see change kind of coming from below and that we would like to see also informing these global processes. Thanks so much, Claudia. And I think in, in saying that, what you also highlight is perhaps the challenge for dealing with biodiversity at the global scale when it is such a place-based issue. So, you know, things such as, I think, is it called the Edinburgh, under the CBD with, with um, cities at the Edinburgh Declaration or the Edinburgh Initiative around subnational governance helpful, but then I think I think linking to your point, the importance of linking to initiatives that are already ongoing uh, within um, national jurisdictions. Wow, I'm conscious that we have three minutes left. I, I could talk to you, <laughs> all of you, all night long. Um, this has been absolutely fascinating. Um, if anyone would Given we have three minutes, and I do want to make use of, of all of this time, if, if anyone has a burning point that hasn't been covered yet that you would like to make, please raise your hand now. I'm not seeing any questions coming through. Ice, go ahead. Not that, you know, I should be having the last word on anything. <laughs> Just, um, so Claudia and I are in the same uh, study group on benefit sharing, which will turn into more of a theme. So we have these discussions all the time and I and I love chatting with her about these things. She has so much knowledge and so much depth. I, I really love, I really love learning from her. Uh, I think I want to talk about my my hopeful part because you know, we do live in a world of dichotomy and we live in a system that was established by mainly by one part of the world. So we can't deny that. But there is also a lot of people in that one part of the world that have adhere to different values and maybe realize hey we're not doing everything right here so it's not that you know people in one part of the world are terrible and the other part of the world are amazing it's just more about you know people are the same everywhere but the systems divide us and I think what I've seen that was so hopeful for me was that when I started working on the and benefit sharing issues ABS issues biosafety 10 years ago I was much less hopeful and that's actually quite strange because when you just start you're supposed to be more hopeful right but then recently in this cop i've met so many young colleagues who are doing their phds on on these issues environmental justice issues indigenous rights issues and most of these colleagues are from the global so-called global north and the, their their standpoint was like okay maybe historically where we are at has not done the best stuff in the world and how can we proceed from that and I've, I'm now seeing that, and I love that. And I love, I, of course, this has this narrative has existed for such a long time, but I'm now seeing that at the COP. And that gives me a lot of hope. And one more thing is that what I've noticed a lot in the here in the COP is that most of the indigenous community leaders or, or those who are, who are representing the communities and peoples start talking about their grief and the pain that they feel. We have to listen to that and we have to listen to our pain and our grief. We can't move forward without accepting the situation we are in. And I think that is done best by the indigenous peoples. They tell us exactly the situation we are in and we need to feel into that situation because at the end they were all humans and we work with our feelings and lawmaking practically is mostly about our feelings about a situation. So that's all I'm going to say. Thank you, Ice. And I think it's probably fitting that we give the final word to a chair of WSL, Christina. Thanks, Michelle, but I'll put the final word back to you in a second. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to um, just add a very brief comment on Andy's question um, on, on uh, nature rights. Uh, it's, it's something that links back to what I said in the beginning. Let's hope we get strong 
fair, equitable, effective targets adopted next or this week, hopefully this week, not next week. Um, but it will be absolutely crucial that they're implemented well. I mean, there was nothing wrong with the IEG targets. As, as Claudia said, there was euphoria when they were adopted, but they were not achieved. So we have to make sure that this new set of 21 targets actually is being implemented and achieved. And that links back to what needs to be done once they are adopted, and it goes all back to the national and sub-national and local and, and, and village level, because that's where we need an all hands on board approach and all tools that we possibly can find, including rights of nature, uh, uh, rights based approaches, standards and so forth. It's an all hands on board and all of society approach, including all important stakeholders, indigenous peoples, local communities, youth, children and everyone that has a stake in it. So I just wanted to point out in that. And finally, I just wanted to mention that the WCL has another task force and a task force on rights of nature, which is chaired by Philip Collett. It's a joint task force with the IUSN Secretariat, uh, with Sabrina Nix, and we're working uh, very closely on elevating this issue of rights of nature from the domestic discourse to an international discourse within the context of, of the WCL and IUCN. But with that, I just wanted to thank everyone joining us here on behalf of WCL for that very in-depth, in incredibly interesting discussion, which took us into very many different aspects that are absolutely central to the GBF. And I would like to thank you, Michelle, for convening and for moderating this, this excellent webinar, and all the presenters, and of course, Emmanuel, the chair of the Biodiversity Law Specialist Group, for, for having been here with us. And with that, the floor goes back to you, Michelle. Many thanks. Thanks so much, Christina. And I'm just going to conclude by echoing everything you said. It's been a fascinating, fantastic discussion, both in terms of the breadth of issues around biodiversity law, but of course, also around the depth. And what better phrase to end with than we need all hands on deck, not just in the next few days, but in the years and decades beyond that. So thank you again. It's been just a delight. Thank you so much. And um, I'll, I'll leave it at, at that. Good night, good morning, good afternoon. Enjoy your lunch in some parts of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>